All right, so sorry about that. There was somebody came in um, and they thought there was a class in here. So, so let's see where we were. Let's see from here. Okay, we were in the middle uh, talking about the critical points. All right, so given our autonomous form, uh, remember the assumption was that this had to be continuous. Okay. It has to be continuous and on some interval, and it has to be um, the um, first derivative must be must be continuous. Okay. All right, so here's the definition of a critical point. Okay, so we're gonna let C, all right, so we set, let C be an element of this set of real numbers. Okay, so if, actually, if F C equals zero, okay, then, right, then we say that C is a critical point. So this is almost, this, this is very similar to the definition that you first learned in Calc 1. Um, so we set this because this is already the derivative. So you're setting this equal to zero, right? And so whatever value that makes this zero, that's gonna be your critical point. Sometimes we can, so sometimes we call these equilibrium points, okay? Can also be called an equilibrium point. Okay. Or sometimes we saw we say stationary point. Okay. So let's look at an example of this. Okay. And the example I'm going to use here is it's going to be using the logistic function. Okay. And we're going to assume that A is strictly bigger than B. So what we do, okay, um, so basically we go back to the definition, right? Apply it here, okay? So we're gonna take, right, we're gonna take this, set it equal to zero. Okay. So obviously we're gonna get two, right? We're gonna get two solutions. One case, P is gonna be zero. Uh, the other case is that P is going to be equal to, if we set this, and we're gonna get A over B, okay? So those are your two equilibrium points, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna uh, test the, we're gonna look at, we're gonna put these on the number line, okay? And let's say here's, right, so here's zero, right? And here's A over B, okay? 
We're also gonna, we also need to make the assumption here that B is strictly bigger than zero here, okay? Okay. So then just like back in count one, right? Um, we basically use test points, all right? So we pick a point from each region. Okay? So we have, so okay, we have our partition, our number line. Okay, so we're gonna pick a point for each one of these, okay? And then we're gonna see, basically pick a point, plug it back into there, right? And then see whether you know that will tell us to give us some information about the slope. Okay, this is about the solution curve. Right? So let's say negative. So I'm gonna pick negative one. Uh, this is one half a over b. And let's pick over here. I chose two a over b. Right? So let's pick. Let's see what happens for each of these points. Okay? All right. So for p equals negative one. Okay. okay, so we're going to put it back into our, we're going to put it back into here. Okay. So for B equals negative one, right, we're going to end up getting negative one, A times B times negative one. Okay. And then from there, okay, we can go ahead and this is going to be minus right, times A plus B. So then, right? So based on our assumption, what does this have to be, right? Positive or negative? Well, obviously it has to be what? It has to be negative value, right? Because we know that A, well, A is bigger than B, B is bigger than zero, okay? Okay. So therefore everything in here, right? Everything in here is gonna be, right? That's gonna tell us basically for the solution curve, um, each of those tangent lines are gonna be negative, okay? All right, so let's look at the other one, the other point. Let's do that over here. Or actually, let's do it for here. So for P equals to one half, you know, B, and plugging that back into there, so we end up getting one half A over B. Okay. All right, so let's see, simplify all this. We get one half A squared over B. And then let's see, I go ahead and distribute all this. So we're gonna get one fourth. Um, that cancels out and we're left with A squared over Okay, and then therefore we're going to end up getting one fourth a squared over b here. Right? So therefore, because a is a is bigger than b, right, and and uh, b is bigger than equal zero, so in fact, right, this should be strictly bigger than zero. So this is going to be bigger than zero. Okay? All right. So this means everything because at this point, that means everything in here between zero and a over b is going to have the tangent line, right? It's going to be to the curve, the tangent line to the slope, or to the, sorry, the tangent line, right? the slope of that tangent line to the curve is going to be positive. Okay? So last point, okay, last test value, two a over b. So I'm plugging it back in here. All right, so that's going to be 2a squared over b, um, and then we get, it's going to give us 4a squared over b, All right? And then that's going to be minus 2a squared over b. So therefore, because again, a and b are positive, this is going to be negative, All right? So that means everything in here is negative, okay? All the slopes, right? All the slope of those tangent lines are negative. All right, so let's summarize this. So what we can do is we can construct, based on this information, we can construct, we can construct a base portion. So typically the phase portrait 
because we're dealing with, um, because P is our dependent variable, we normally write this way. So vertical axis, right? And then we go ahead and put our points on there. A over B, and here is zero. All right, so what we're going to do here is we can go and sketch in the information here. Right? So between minus infinity and zero, it was all negative. So we draw arrow downward to indicate that. Okay. okay. And then between zero and A over B, it's positive. So we're going to draw arrow up to indicate that. Okay. And then uh, going past A over B, right, for this part, it's going to be. Okay. So those are your, right? So that's your face portrait, okay? So the face portrait doesn't, basically that's all there is, okay? Um, and then you have your, so basically what this is going to tell you, okay, you have your equilibrium points. Okay. So what this is saying, again, if you think about this in terms of the tangent, in terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the slope of the tangent lines, okay. So this will be negative. Okay. Uh, so that means everything will be going downward. Okay. Everything will be facing away from that equilibrium point, right? Okay. And then positive, right? Positive slopes in here, and then negative slopes in here. So it's a very, it's a very rough, it's just a very rough picture, but it gives us an idea. It get, basically it gives us a sense on the behavior of the curve. Okay. So it's not, it's not going to give us the accurate, you know, solution, but it gives us an idea, a depiction. Of what the solution will look like. Okay. So you got to remember, like a what, like 200 years ago, all right? They didn't have, you know, they didn't have computers, obviously. So they, so this is the only way we can get an idea of what the solution is doing. Right. So there's a, so there's a few uh, names for this, uh, for these points. Uh, this here, this is called a repeller. Okay. Here is repeller. So basically, what's saying is that the curve, the solution curves are facing away. They're going to converge away from that. Okay, so this is what we call repeller. Okay. And then the other one, right, is basically an attractor. Okay. It's an attractor point. Meaning that the solution curves are going to eventually, right? They're going to they're going to approach this value a over b. Okay. Again, very rough sketch. Okay. Doesn't right? it doesn't look exactly like that, but it gives us an idea of what the of what those unit vectors are doing. Okay. okay. Let's see. So let's look at, we're going to do, show you a particular example and then, and then show how to implement this in Opti. Yeah. That's right.
Okay, so let's look at a specific example here. So this is actually the solution, um, right? So going through, if you actually you can solve this by using, um, if you use partial fractions, okay? Uh, then you end up getting this form, right? But we're interested in just looking at, okay, we're, we're gonna look at a particular, uh, we wanna look at the uh, particular values of this. So we're gonna look at, we're gonna say P naught, that's the initial value of P one. Um, we're, gonna have, we're gonna have A equals six and B equals two. So therefore, for these for these values, right, we're going to have six. Minus a minus two t. Okay. Oh, eight t. Sorry, six t. So six t. Sorry, a is six. All right. All right, so, um, so this is our solution, remember, and that is, right, so that is the solution to this. So A was six, right, B was, we're assuming was two. So in fact, we should be able to see, okay, um, from this, we can tell that our, right, our equilibrium point is gonna be three, right? Okay, and obviously it'll be zero. In fact, this is sometimes referred to as because this again, this is a logistic model. This is our carrying capacity. Okay. So let's look at this. Okay. Okay. So I need to turn on this. There's the code. So me a little bit. Okay. So let me go ahead and step through. Describe a little bit here what's, what's, what's doing. All right. Um, so whenever you do octave, okay, you always should always clear clear everything, right? This basically clears out all the variables, and then you have the clear screen, and then this will close all any windows that are open. Okay? And then tick. It's always good programming practice to time your code, uh, especially for more advanced coding. Uh, for code, if you're doing like more advanced programming. So this is just starts a timer, right? So that's gonna start a timer and then somewhere down the line, I turn it off using talk, TikTok, right? Okay. Um, so for this, what we're gonna do, okay, is, okay, we're gonna define our linear space, okay? So we're gonna go, we're gonna actually define it from minus five to 10, and then we're gonna include 50 points in there, right? Okay, and then we're gonna make a copy of this. Very easy to do in, in Octave, just say Y equals X. It's gonna copy everything to Y. Okay. So, so then from there, right, from there you can create a mesh grid, right? Because we have the same number of elements, we can easily do this. So we're going to take, we're creating basically a, an array here, okay. or in this case, a double, a double array. So we have a mesh grid, okay? So it's going to, so this is built in. It's going to take your X and Y values, and we're going to store them into here, right? Column for X, column for Y. And then, 
So that's going to be used later on. Okay. And then this is how you define a function in Octave. So you define it, you put an at xy here. That's telling us that we want to um, use those as our inputs. And the thing about Octave, right, very similar to MATLAB, is that whenever, because we are working with arrays, vectors, we always want to make sure you put a dot there, right? Because this is defined as a, right? We're defining this as an as an as a rate or, or a vector, and then we're multiplied by another vector. So we're doing things component wise. Yeah? Okay. So we need to put make sure to put a dot there. If that was a constant, like you, you have a constant times a vector, that's already that's, you know, that's that's an automatic, um, that's automatically uh, recognized. Okay. So you have a vector here, and this is also going to be a vector. So we need a dot here. Here again, we don't need a dot, right? Because this is just a scalar. Okay, so that's our function. That is coming from here, right? That's what we're working with, right? Okay. Oh, uh, here, this one, sorry. Okay. That's the one we have, okay. And then, so we have our, right? So then from there, we have our, um, we're gonna say dy is equal to these. Because right, that's how we're defining our function. And then we're saying dx is equal to ones. So this is going to create a, uh, basically an array with just ones with a size of whatever dy is. So that way we're working with the same size, well, the arrays are the same size. And then, okay, this is basically used to normalize the vectors. Okay, so we're using the, um, basically we're just using the fact that um, we're taking, this is used to, right, to normalize the vector, right? Okay, so we have X, so we take the norm. This is just the distance, okay, for each for each X and Y value. Okay? And then we use this quiver. So quiver is actually a built-in quiver meaning arrow. So this is a built-in routine, same with, with MATLAB. Okay, so we're gonna take the values, we're gonna use the X and Y values that we, that we define up here, okay? That's coming from this. And then we're going to normalize. So we have dx, we already defined dx and dy. So we're gonna normalize those. So what this is gonna do, okay? So here's your, so here's your grid. Okay. So what you're gonna do, what it's doing is this. So let's say you're at some coordinate, okay? So what this quiver package is going to do, it's going to compute, basically it's going to take, again, it's going to have dx, we know dx is one, right? And then at this point, we have dx and then dy, okay? So dy is attained from this function, right? It's attained from here, okay? So, we, so when we plug in the value for y for that point, it's going to compute this, okay? Let's see, we're here. And so that's enough information, okay? It's enough information to get the slope, right? So um, whatever it's gonna be, we can compute the slope from here, okay? So it may not be like this, maybe something like this. Right? And then from there, right, it will you know, maybe something like this, depending on where, it depends on where this help, it depends on the D by value, okay? So, the, so that's why this is one. Okay, it doesn't matter, right? We can, so here we just say it's one because we have dy from dx, right? That's gonna give us what we need. So each of these, so each of these will be spaced out by one unit. Okay. And then we scale this, we can scale this by any factor. So I use 0.5 here for visual purposes. So that's what, that's the information it's using. For each x and y value, it's basically constructing an arrow. Okay, so that's all built into here, into quiver. So it's using, it's basically using the, the slope. Okay. Okay. Okay, so then, right, we, do, do, we define our quiver um, and then we define our axis. So it's always x, y, x, right? x min, x max, y min, y max. And then this type. So it's going to be the slope field. So you put quotes in that. Okay. And, then, and then what I do here is the way you superimpose two plots or two or more plots is you use the hold on command. So this says, okay, 
All right, we, we're going to plot. We're going to plot our quiver. Okay. All right, we're going to. This is going to create a plot. All right, and then we're going to say, wait a minute. We're going to say, uh, wait. We're going to plot one more on top of that. So we say, hold on. All right, and then we're going to plot the. Basically, we're going to plot the solution curve. Or sorry, not the solution. The um, the, the the solution to this problem. Okay, which is this. Okay. So. Okay, this is our this is the solution, right? So that's actually going to um, give us our particular that's what's that's basically our particular solution. Okay, so let's see, let's plot this. So we go up here, okay. Run. So you, when you run, it's gonna. So if you haven't saved it, it's gonna ask you to save the file and then just run. It's gonna save you any modifications, and there it is. Really. I'm sorry. I can't really read the. Oh, okay. So which, one, which part? Like the, the font is just. Like oh, I can not, increase it. Oh, I can increase it. Not the size. It's like the resolution is not. Good. Oh. Let's see. I think it's the projector. Oh, okay. That's okay. I, I, I can guess. I thought it was weird that all of the. Commands ended in commas. Um, yeah, semicolon, yeah. Actually, I mean, I can, I can, I think this is probably on canvas somewhere. I can, I can, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be posted there with the assignment, the next assignment. Okay, so. So yeah, just keep in mind this quiver is built in package, so it requires four inputs. And then the fifth, well, the fifth one is just for scaling, but it's, it's really not necessary. Um, all right. So we run this. Okay, so it's already run. So there's another window here. I need to share that. There we go. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay. There it is. Right. So there's our. Uh, there's our. Each of these are. Um, are your vectors, right? Those are tangential vectors to the solution curve. And here's your, so basically this gives you um, an idea of what your solution will look like, okay? And then if you have a particular one, right? Just the one we have there, this, right? this is your, basically the particular solution, okay? So you can see that, right? As we, you know, as we already know, is, you know, these should be converging to your equilibrium point three, right? And then, so this is your, Basically, we right, this is your tractor, right? And this is a repeller at zero. Okay. So, all right, so you have a okay, you have an attractor here and a repeller at zero. And it gives you that, right? It gives you that well-defined logistic curve. Okay, there's your car carrying capacity. So normally they use this, like this kind of model they use if you're like, and you, if you have like, you know, a restriction on a certain, like let's say deer population, right? And you're trying to, con you're trying to have control the amount of deer. So there's a carrying capacity there. Right? So this is very, so this is actually, you know, because using the other model that we, for the, like the one we use for world population, right? That one is not realistic for that, for that, um, for restricted region okay okay yeah. why did i save my file it says oh. it's an invalid name oh let me see they give me an invalid name so how do i save as oh okay yeah go back to file yeah 
and then save. Okay, save workspace as yeah. And then click here on like make sure. Um, save, yeah. So save it using. So save it using whatever file. Name. So where do I use it? Oh, okay. So did you run it? All right. So if it's not coming off, then that means go to let's see. And go to your command window, and there may be some error there. No, 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 not that one. No, I'm sorry, I'm updating. So yeah, there's something. Is there some issue? Oh. Okay, let me take a look at it real quick. Let me just see. Where it was. You have another one? No. Why does like overwritten it and moved it to the recycling bin? Yeah, there it is. So it feels good. I think it's because I saved the. Maybe you saved. Oh, maybe you saved it as a workspace. It's... Oh. Yeah. Did you do it? In, did you type it here or in the other one? Okay, let me let me email to you. Oh, good. Okay, back. Okay. Okay, so let's see. So run it from here. Oh. Okay, you may want to save it on a different. You may want to save it on a different directory. There could be something. Go back to editor. Are you sure that everything's? Because when I tried to name it like something else with like spaces, yeah. is it not a valid oh, yeah. identity? You don't want to name it. Yeah, try not to put spaces. Yeah, yeah. so I replaced it with underlines. Okay. okay. And then that's what it's saved as right now. And it's okay. still not going to work. It still says sure. it's a. That's weird. It still says it's not a valid identity. Wait, look here. Let me get my mouse. Yes, that's it. Yeah, that's usually
it's uh oh you control a but you forgot to control c Let's save it. Let's put this. Let's just put this on whatever. Let's put this on your C drive for now. So let's call it whatever file. I called it. Okay. No spaces. Yeah, like okay. Let's see. Underline should be fine. In fact, I have a. Let's see. I don't know. Why. I don't know. Why. I don't know. Just, we just name it like M. Yeah, just I don't know. It's weird. Oh. Why is it having such a hard time? Here. Let's see. Yeah. We just name M. Okay. Yep. Okay. Did something there. Let's save it though. Let's see. Yep. Did it save it? No, it still says unnamed. That's weird. Huh. Let me try. Try to uh, let me email the file and see if you can open it. Let's see. It says access is denied. That's really strange. Okay. Okay. So maybe you can't save on your own C drive. Possibly, I've never saved anything on my C drive. Let me send it this way. Right. See if you like this this the name on the this file currently says slope underscore fields space. Yeah, space. yeah. So it's it's weird. So I don't know. Maybe so I mean some computers they have very picky about that. So I thought maybe I thought originally I thought that was the issue. But let's see what happens. I sent you the file. Oh, I can open it, There it is. Okay, so I think it's something you did. Maybe it's possible that you typed in something wrong. Maybe. Maybe. That's... I will check it when I go. Yeah, check to see. Yeah. Compare those files. But at least you have something working. Yeah. Right. Now I know what it's supposed to. Be. Yeah. yeah. That one is going to be using for the next assignment and for the uh, for another project. So. All right, so you okay, you get the general idea. And then, so let me, so while this is up, okay, so you were having some issues with the first one, right? Or are you just, not really issues, you just maybe, you didn't have, did you have a chance to look at it? Or? Which one was it? So this was Yeah, this was the assignment. 
then um, let's see, yeah. So you just basically define these, right? And then you just type these in, right? That's just to give you some exposure to using an octave. Um, so keep in mind that for this, right? Whenever in octave, we don't use e, like we don't type it like that, right? We can type it in exp. And then, right, so this would be, yeah, you would use exp here. And then for absolute value, it's a, b, s. And then pi would be just pi. Yeah. And then the second one, so they give you, basically they give you the differential equation and they give you a solution. So uh, we'll talk about how to solve this later. Right? But there's a solution. So you just need to plot this. Okay. Plot some. So let's see. So plot, right? So plot, you can find your points. Let's see, we can do lens space. We can do from zero, let's say, to 10. So basically it gives you, right, uh, 10 point, right? It gives you 10, right? zero, 0 to 10. Okay, actually, it's fine. Uh, 0 to, let's see, point from 0 to 10, but we have 20 points there. Yep, okay. So that's a way you can create your x values. So if you want, so you always have to, it's not like a calculator, right? So you have to actually define your x, your specific x values. Uh, that's one way you can do it. And then if you want to plot, well, you can define um, you can just type in your function and say, uh, let's say x squared, right? So x, but then you need a dot here because you're squaring each component. And it's, okay, so let's put a semicolon. If you don't put semicolon, this is what will happen. It'll just give you the results. It'll display it to your screen. So that's why I like to use semicolon. So I have to display all that. So you want to plot, you have your y, and you have your x and y values, so you just say plot x, y. And there is, went from zero to, in this case, from zero to 10. So, I mean, so I have to share that other side. There is, there is. So that gives you part of the problem. So it's a lot, you have a lot more control, right, with this kind of, That's why uh, we could even put a title. Right. So there's there's a title, right? Just say you know, whatever you want. All right, so there's, right, there's your plot. You can do, you could put a uh, grid. This, that makes it like a little nicer. So that's the, that was the, that was the second, that's the purpose of the second one. Just to get you familiar with plotting a function. And then the third one is really nice, especially if you're taking the near algebra. Um, there are several ways, actually, I, had, yeah, I think I posted some videos for this. So, like, if you want to solve a system, let's see, let's see. Okay. 
So let's say we have a, the way you define a matrix, right? Let's say we have one, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's always row, right? Row, first row, second row, third row. And you separate by semicolons. Right? So you get three by three. And let's say our, our vector, let's say our uh, V vector is, let's say C. Okay. So we have a system now. So the easiest way to do this, or one of the ways you can do this, is to use this backslash command. And that's not surprising because I just made up the matrix. So this tells me that there's a singular, uh, it looks like one of the pivots is pretty close to zero. Mm. So let's see. So. This one is specifically like this command is only good if there's a unique solution. Okay. The actually better way to do this is, is to use like REF. So let's say. Uh, yes. Yeah. Four, four, five, six, and two, and three. Okay. So I just basically augmented the matrix, the coefficient matrix with the vector B, right? So you could do REF, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And, and that is, yeah, that is why we got a singular error because this turns out that the columns of this matrix, turns out the columns here are narrowly dependent. So we get infinite solutions set there. Free variable. Yep. You got a free variable, that's right. Which tells us, yep, it's also saying that columns are literally dependent. So that backslash is only, it, it works only if there's a unique solution. Yeah. So, for, so you would do like REF, and then from there you would you know, you just find your solution. Right? Okay. Um, you can also do inverse. However, it won't work for this. Right? This one does it's not. This is a basically a singular matrix. Right? Oh, let's go back. <laughs> not this one. Not this one. Yeah, obviously that's not going to work. But this will not work also because um, you have to see. You're getting some precision error here. So you're blowing up. You're getting basically infinity. <laughs> Get very large. So that's that's a that's a computer saying that yeah, this is these values it's, it's are blowing up in the, in the algorithm. All right. So yeah. Um, so for that problem back here. So for this, this actually has a unique solution. You would just define your, you could create a matrix, coefficient matrix from these, define your V vector, you use the backslash command, or you can use REF, whatever, whichever you want. It's just like, again, it's just very, it's just to get you familiar with Octane. Because a lot of students, they have, they have no, like, they not familiar with this, right? So not familiar with using a computation tool. So a lot of them are going to engineering. Okay. Okay, let's move on here. Ready? All right. Let's so um so the next so we're gonna go down, right? We're gonna start talking about the higher order differential equation. So there's a little bit of preliminary theory there. Probably that you're probably familiar with some of these, but it doesn't work too much. Good. Okay, so um, there are like, I mean, there are two basic type of ODEs. One is homogeneous. Okay. And the other is non-homogeneous. 
Have you taken, you're probably taking linear algebra, right? So it's very similar here. You see a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of overlap between linear algebra and differential equations in terms of the concepts. Uh, same thing here, right? So if you recall, right, in linear algebra, we have AX equal to zero, right? Um, the homogeneous, right? So, um, so that's, so there's something similar here. Um, you have basically, you have the right-hand side is zero, and then if it's not zero, then you get non-homogeneous. So um, we're going to be talking about, and the, so they talk about this, and um, in this course is if you, so the idea is that you solve for the homogeneous part, and then you solve for the non-homogeneous part, okay? So you're going to see a lot of that uh, being applied. Complementary and particular solution. Hmm? Complementary and particular Exactly. Solution. Yeah, that's right. Yep, complementary and the and the uh, and the other part not not complementary. Particular. Particular, yeah. So that's sometimes they use those terms. All right, so let's see. So let's talk about, yep, yeah, so let's look at let's focus on the homogeneous part. And so let's look at some of the differential operators. So sometimes we use instead of using dy dx, sometimes we use dy. So if you use it, so this way you're using it as a differential operator. Okay. Um, so for example, right, so we can say where. In fact, that's really what it is. That's really what this is. It's, it's just a differential operator. So, um, so if we say d of sine of 4x, and we're assuming that x is the infinite variable, then this is just going to be what? 4 cosine 4x. Or if we have d of x cubed minus 1, then this is obviously going to be 3x squared. Okay? So it's just a notation. Okay? And then for higher order, it works like this. Right, so when you take the derivative, right, if you apply the differential operator to D, to this, to the first order, then this is just, right, that's all that is. And then in terms of the operators, right, this is just going to be D of, right, or D squared of Y, okay? So in general, right, this can be generalized. So sometimes, you know, depending on the textbook, I think it, even this book uses this kind of notation. Okay. All right. Let's so let's talk. Let's look at some some of the specific properties. Okay. Linearity, the linearity property. Again, using D as our differential operator. And if we take the derivative of this, right, then we know that we can split this up, right, over the, over this, over the summer difference. And then obviously this could be applied for more than two functions.
And then the other one, right, is that if you have a constant, then we can basically take that constant outside the differential operator. So this, so both of these being satisfied tells us that the differential operator is linear. That's all that means. Okay. In fact, you can, right, we can extend this idea. So if you have something like this, so if you have D, let's say F1 of X plus let's say minus F2 of X, dot, 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 you can extend this idea. And then let's well, let's put some constants in front of there. Let's put some constants in there. What are the properties called? One of them is like trans. Is it transitivity? Um, okay, this one. Which one? I know in um, linear algebra they have names. There's a yeah. So you can also think of this as a as a transformation. Yeah. Right. But there's one that's called the superposition principle. So it's. Yeah. Yeah. This is linear. That's that's basically what it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, what are the terms for it? Forget oh, you're probably thinking of uh, a linear transformation. Yeah, that's that has a term. That's exactly so. That is so that in that case for transformations for linear trans. So when we say a linear transformation, it also satisfies these two properties. What are each of the properties called? Um. Uh, let's see. Well, I don't. That I'm not sure actually. I don't know what I mean. This is basically just applying the differential operator over this. And this is just taking out a constant. But there's a name for the combination of these two. And that's what I'm going to get at here. So, yeah. I don't think the name, I don't think there's actually, the name is not really, I mean, there is a name if you put everything together. So, if you have a finite number of functions, right, like this. And so then this, because this is a linear different, this is a linear operator. So we can say this. So you're probably thinking of this. This is actually what's called the superposition principle. Is just an extension of this idea. All right. All right, here's an example. Okay. So a lot of, you'll notice. So like with this example, let's say we let let's say that's x squared. So let's assume that both of these are, are both each of these are solutions, are both solutions. So this is actually um, this type of equation, by the way, this is called an Euler. Well, basically, this is an Euler, or it's called Cauchy Euler. Yeah. We'll get to those later. Yeah. So the, the thing is the, the order, right? The order of each monomial, not just the order of the um, of the derivative. So you have three, three, one, one, and then, and then zero, zero. So there's a special case. 
But anyway, we don't. So you don't need to worry about where these two are coming from. We're just saying that solution. Right? That's a solution to this whole, to this homogeneous uh, differential equation. So then we know automatically because of this, because of right, because we know this much. Right, because of this, then we can say what? Well, we can take, right? We can say that y, right? Uh, basically, we, we can take, use the superposition principle. So y is going to be equal to c1 times x squared plus c2 times x squared natural log x. So that's using the super, superposition principle. If you, so if you think about it, what else does this remind you of from linear algebra? Well, this is just, if you think about it, these are, these can be shown that they're literally independent of each other. So what we have is that we form, this is actually um, nothing more than why, right? This, the overall solution, the general solution is, it's written as a linear combination of Y1 and Y2, right? So these are actually, right? Those are actually bases, right? So what we can say here is that y, so y is just equal to, sometimes we write, we use this term span. So all the solution, right? The, the whole solution set can be expressed in this way. So a lot of problems that we'll be doing, right? A lot of the problems that we'll be going through is we'll be looking at the uh, homogeneous part and then solving it and then adding the two. In fact, um, not today, but next time, maybe you can do this on Thursday. There is a technique. If you're given one of these, right? If you're given one of these, you could find the second solution. So there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there's a process. We'll go through, I'll go through that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So A and 3 is. Yeah, basically, it's just matches. One and then A1 is 2. Or negative. Let me see which one. Yeah. So yeah. A3 exactly. on the first term is 1. Right. A1 on the second term is negative 2, yep. where the powers are x. Yep, they have to match. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And then it's not plus. Oh, yeah, that's how much you So we'll get to the, yeah, so, I mean, you're welcome to read that, um, but we are gonna get to that later on. This is, like I said, this is sort of just a preliminary theory, okay? Or what we're gonna do later on. All right, so. Let's see, we have, suppose we have, suppose we have a, uh, a finite collection of functions here, okay? If, And so let's say these, if these functions are literally dependent on an interval, then uh, there exists uh, 
cf. So there exists some constants, right, that are not all zero. That's the key here. Such that C1 plus X1 plus C2 plus X2 plus dot dot dot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. 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 Yeah, so this is very analogous to the uh, to the one to the definition in uh, linear algebra, except that in there you look at vectors, right? In fact, if you remember, there's a that you could use the isomorphism isomorphism theorem to map the vector to a polynomial, right, and vice versa, right? So, so that this is very important, right? Um, if all it takes is one of these constants to be not zero, and it would just make everything literally dependent. Okay, so. So there exists, it could be one, right? Or it could be more than one, right? But they, they are not all zero, okay? So there exists some constants that are not, if they're, so, so basically, right? If, if the only solution to this is the fact that C1, C2, and C, that, that all these constants are zero, that's the only, so basically the trivial solution. Therefore, those functions are nearly independent. If not, right, then it's nearly dependent. All right, it's very, very important uh, for the middle here. So let's say, so with that in mind, right? So let's assume that C1 is not zero. Then what you can do is because it's not zero, then you can take one of these, you can take this function and express it as a linear combination of the others, right? So you could rewrite this. I see one. And then from there, you can see that right, this is just going to be minus Cn over C1, X, C2, C1. So this is sort of just illustrating the fact that we have that this function is written as a linear combination of the remaining functions. And that's one of the properties of, uh, of linear dependence. So this is, right, so we have a constant here. We know that's, we have this, this is, this is a constant, right? this is a constant, another constant. So therefore F is written as a linear combination of the remaining functions. So that's, right, so you can do that. Obviously this is literally dependent, right? That will be used. So this idea will be used to derive some other techniques right, for solving differential equations. So just kind of summarize that this theorem. Again, this is just a summary where we just went over. So, so if this is linearly dependent, then right, it's actually it's a biconditional statement. So if and only if at least So it just means again, at least one of the other one of the functions that S can be represented as a linear combination of the others, the other functions. 
and vice versa, right? So if that's the case, then we can go in this direction, right? So this is by direction, by, by conditional. All right. Uh, the other, so as a consequence okay, of this, So if F1, if these two functions, right, if these are literally independent, then some interval, okay, then the quotient, if you take the ratio of those, doesn't matter the order, uh, this is going to be non-constant. So this idea actually is this idea is actually going to be used in um, in deriving uh, the idea. So the idea is that if we're given, let's say, a second order differential equation, and you're given one solution, right? So therefore, there must be another solution, right? Um, there's second order, so we can use this idea, right, to construct, right? So we have, let's say, u u is equal to this, and we want to find two linear independent solutions. So we can use, we can set u to be this, and then that way we have f of x1, right? So let's say u is equal to this. So that would mean that u, so that means f2 would be equal to u times f1. So we can use this, right? We can actually substitute, substitute this back into the differential equation and come out with a technique to find f2. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So we'll get to that. Yeah, I'll, that's just sort of what's coming ahead. Yeah. Okay. Right. You okay? Yeah. Not that bad, right? Let me show you an example. Right? Let me show you an example of this here. So, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's look here. Let's see. Make sure. Yeah. Let's do this here. Okay. All right, so we know there's a, right, there's a trig identity uh, that basically relates these two. Right, we know that's the case, right? Sine 2x is equal to 2 times sine x times cosine. And so we can use this. Right? So here's F1, here's F2. So F1, right, I'm just dropping the X there, but F1 divided by F2 is equal to two, right? So this, therefore, this shows us that these two functions are basically, right, are nearly dependent. Right. If it wasn't, then we would end up with a variable, right? We would end up with an x somehow, function in terms of x, okay? In fact, another way to show this is just using the idea of linear combination.
right? So sine two x minus sine, right? This is well, we know that this is equal to okay, this is equal to two sine cosine x. So we found a constant there. Right? So, um, so this would be like c one. So we found constants besides zero that make this a true statement. So that's another way that we can show that these are literally dependent. Very similar, very, very analogous to the to, um, to linear algebra. It's okay, or, or, or. we can also do we can also do um, we can also use the idea of the Roscan. Which is which is introduced here. Well, let's do another example here, just in case. I think we'll probably probably get it from here. Suppose we have a collection of functions. So, so these are all basically they all have a common uh, domain of zero to infinity. So this is another right. This is another collection of functions. They're literally dependent. Now this one's a little bit more, a little bit more hard. It's a little more, I would say, more difficult to, to uh, determine that. But there is, uh, there does, there is a uh, basically there is a function, namely f of two, that can be represented as a linear combination of the others. So it turns out that f of two of x okay. Let's see what I have here. Yeah, f of two of x, you have one. So one of these plus five of these. And then zero of f four of x. So that will work. So it's because of this, right, that we took one of these functions and wrote it as a linear combination of the remaining functions. Therefore, this shows that this is uh, this collection is never dependent. I'm gonna wrote it in my own words. Okay, that's fine. For higher order differential equations, the principle is to find the basis solutions that are linearly independent so that they span the entire space. Okay. And a first order 
y equals c f of x yeah. is good enough since a one dimensional space only needs a basis with one element and all right. linear combinations of that element only include multiples of yeah. itself. Yeah, that's fine. For which more than one basis solution is required for higher orders. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have like third like third degree differential equation, then it's obviously your your basis solution consists of three functions, right? Okay, so it can't go beyond that. Yeah, and that actually has to do, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's an analog, there's very analogous to uh, to vector spaces. Does the isomorphism between vector spaces and polynomial spaces can be treated with the same linear operators? Yeah. Yep. All right, so let's talk about the Ronskian here. Okay. Um, so the Ronskian is basically right. If you have, let's just talk about Ronskian have two two functions. So it's another way to um, basically it's another way to uh, figure out the determinant. So if you look at Ronskian, so you have y one, y two. And it's always going to be built, right? You're always going to be square matrix. Okay, so you take successive derivatives. Okay, and the result of this, right? So whatever this is not equal to zero on some, okay, on whatever interval, then this shows, okay, this basically shows that y one. And y two are are literally independent. On that interval. Wronski. Yeah. Wronski. Yeah. So many right here. So, using the Rodsky on this, right, this is a little bit difficult to, this is kind of like, you have to kind of play around with the values to make it work, but the Rodsky would be ideal for that situation. But let's look, let's look at how to apply this. Let's say, okay, so let's say we have So both of these are solutions, okay, for, for the second order. Again, you don't have to worry about that. We'll, we'll actually get to that later. And we're on the so the solutions basically we're on we're going for minus for basically for the whole real line. So let's. Figure out what is right. So let's figure out the possibilities. So we have e to the three, e to the three x, and e to the minus three x. Okay. So you take successive derivatives. And we know that for a square matrix, right, it's this minus the product, these two minus the product. This. Okay, which is going to give us, obviously, that's minus six, eight, six X. And again, it doesn't matter. You could switch these around. Right, because if you switch columns, if you remember, you switch columns, then it just, um, just like you switch rows, then it changes the sign of the determinant. So it doesn't matter how you set this up. 
So, okay, so this is this is zero, right? Or not, sorry, not equals zero for all x. So therefore, this shows that these are literally independent. Okay. Why is the derivative of e negative three x negative three e three x? That's a negative here. Sorry, it's a negative. Sorry. And then would not e three x? Yeah, sorry. So hold on. It should just be six. This should just be six. Sorry. That's, okay. that's a slight oversight on my part. Sorry. You're right. So that should be minus there. So that's going to be zero. And this will be zero. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry. 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 No worries. <laughs> I'm not feeling that well today, as you can tell. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So, yeah I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So that's correct. That's a nice catch there. Yeah. All right. So we get minus six. So still not equal to zero. Right? So, Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So therefore, right? Um, because of that, then what this tells us that we can the general solution, right? The general solution to this, we can basically take the linear combination of this. So this gives us right. This gives us our general solution for this differential for the second order. So that's the that's kind of gives us a little bit of kind of a, the uh, that's going to give us kind of some lead weight and what we're going to do later, right? So when you're given this, there's a way to characteristic this, equation yep, to find the roots. Exactly. Yep. That's going to give us these values, and it should. Be. And then there's one for um, if you have right Imagine repeating. Here. Mid imaginary. Okay. Yep. If you have so if so it turns out that if the roots are repeating, which you have, so that's where you have multiplied multiples. by increments of x yeah. on each of them until yep. you have exactly. And that that idea is actually we're going to derive that using this idea. Yep. So you could get so there's a way, there's an equation to come up with a second solution, and we can apply it there, right? And it turns out that you multiply it by x. That's how you keep them literally independent of each other. Yep. Right. So, so let's do all right. Let's do there's one more. So let's say we want to find the Roscan of these, or let's say, well, eventually we'll, we'll want to do that. But let's say we have. So each of those, or each of those functions are solutions of this. So let's see. So right, and so then what we want to do is we want to find the Rossi of that. All right, so we have one by two by three. 
And it doesn't matter the order in which you put these. So we have e to the x taking successive derivatives, 2e to the 2x. This is going to be 4e to the 2x. This will be uh, 3e to the 3x. This is 9e to the 3x. Now, you could do this using cofactor expansion, but there's another way, right? Do you remember? Yep. Does it? But you have, what do you call it? Basket weaving. That's good. Yeah, I never heard it be referred to, but yeah, that's essentially. What do you call it? Uh, good old method. <laughs> I just, yeah, but I like that basket weaving. Right? Next time I'll, I'll, I'll use that. Yeah. Yep, let's do that. It's actually is it's actually that technique very useful at jump week. And you're finding that like when you're it's using it's fast. It's fast, and yeah, it's useful for doing the cross product. My calculator professor at Mizzou did not like the fact that I kept on doing basket weaving because it was like, well, the correct way to like you can't generalize a basket. You have to use a cofactor to generalize for determinants. Yeah, of yeah that's right. That's the general way of doing it. I don't care. I just want to do it fast. Right, right, right. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to, yeah. If you want to do it, yeah, cofactor, that's fine. Uh, oh. <laughs> I do All right. Slow All right. So let's just do that. It's, it's not too bad. Yeah, in fact, I just showed this yesterday in my linear algebra class. Make sure it shows up there. Okay. So you just take the copy, right? Or just take row or column one, put it here, take column two, put it here. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our basket. So multiply along here. So let's see, we get, this is just what, 18, this is 18 e to the 6x, right? And then this is going to be 3, so 4. Thanks. Three, sorry, how did I get five? This is three. Okay. And then this is going to be four e to the six x. Two e six x. Which one? Oh, that was it. That was the overall. Okay. Yep, two e to the six. Yep. And then so we're gonna take, right? We take this. Uh, we take this and then subtract it from over here. Um, excuse me, Professor. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I haven't taken linear algebra. Can you quickly tell me the name of the method you use for that matrix? Oh, that is so let's call it let's call it basket weaving. Basket okay, basket weaving. weaving. There's really no name for it. And it's just, yeah, so I call it diagonal. Uh, Anway calls it basket weaving, so. Yeah. Okay, oh, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I didn't know you were there, but you just joined, huh? Oh, I've been watching on and off. I'm, I'm actually at work right now. Okay. Oh, okay, no worries. All right, this is being recorded, so. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Basket weaving linear algebra. Basket weaving, yeah. Yeah, there's a ton of different videos or articles from different universities. All right, great. Thank you. Hope that helps. You understand though the process? Um. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, it was just it was just the bit with the matrix that was confusing me. Okay. So yeah. So there you could use cofactor expansion if you want here. Yeah. All right. So we have twelve. Oh, and for context, cofactor expansion is the formal generalizable right. way to find the determinant of any dimensional square matrix. Exactly. And so you take this result. So what we're doing here is we're multiplying along the diagonals, right? 
and then you multiply along these, and then you take this, subtract from these. Okay, okay that makes sense. Okay, I'm glad you're here. It's good. All right. Okay, so what is right? So, um, so this turns out to be what? what was it two e to the six x? Right. Okay. Which is definitely not equal to zero. Therefore, so so therefore, this shows that. Um, these three functions are literally independent of each other. Particularly on this interval. For all x, basically. So the point of all this, right? So we, we're basically doing like a preliminary. So this is like in a lot of books, like before getting into our higher orders, there's like a section devoted this, to these topics. So we're gonna be getting ready to solve obviously higher order differential equations, right? And so a lot of the, the these are what's called fundamental solutions or, in other, or sometimes if you take in linear algebra, uh, right? These are sometimes called the basis solutions. And when you take the linear combination of those, that gives you your general solution. Okay, so that's why this is this idea of linearly independence is very important. Okay? And it's also used, that idea is also used to derive uh, some of the methods that we'll be using to solve different to solve higher order differential equations. Okay, so let's look at this. So any questions on this? General question, how long do you plan to lecture tonight for? Um, I was originally gonna go up to I think what 7 30. Yeah. So it's okay. I don't know if you like need to go home. And also I also probably need to go home at some point too. So yeah, so actually we've come to the this so this is actually the last example. So mm -hmm. next time we'll so on Thursday, so I will do I will start to talk about the reduction of order technique. So that just means, okay, if you're given a second order differential equation and at least one solution, we can find the second solution, right? There's a formula. By, this, by using the wrong skin? No, nope, no, nope, by using something else, yeah. What There's are we a, gonna be using? We're gonna be using a reduction of order formula yeah, to do that. So the wrong skin, that's, so this is also, yeah, the wrong skin, this is gonna be used, uh, this is gonna be used later on, what's called the wrong skin technique for, uh, for other, for, or another technique because the one the one that we'll be doing next is just for basically that is again so second order differential equation and you're provided at least you're providing one solution and you want to come up with a second one okay now what happens if you're not provided that solution right then then we have to look at other strategies all right and so that's where we start to get a little bit deeper into this um professor can you just clarify really quickly um, the wrong scheme that's just used as a check to see if the differential equation is linearly dependent or not. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's that's a yeah, that is a way to um, that is a way to uh, to determine whether a collection of functions are literally independent or dependent on the on the given interval. Yep. Okay. It's a very nice um, way. Yep. Yeah, and that um, that also means that like when you divide them. Like y one over y two, um, we check whether it's constant or not, right? And that's like the same thing. Yes. So that's another. That is another way you could do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then so, you use like the matrix if it's like a more complicated equation. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. So yeah, if you take the ratio, let's say you're looking at two functions. If you take the ratio and you end up with something not constant, then that tells you that they're literally uh, independent. So we'll be using that. In fact, we'll be using that idea uh, to come up with the uh, to come up with the formula for the what's called the reduction of order. Um, sorry, yeah, not the reduction or sorry, the, yeah, the reduction of order formula, right? Okay, so we'll be doing that next. Okay. So I'll we'll stop here. Um, so Max, uh, you go by Max or Maxwell? I go by Max, but Zoom won't let me change it for some reason. Okay, okay, so Max, so are you okay with the octave? Did you have any, are you okay with that? Um, it took me longer than I thought, uh, to learn it. Um, but I think I've got the hang of it now. Okay, all right, great. So the next assignment will basically be, um, I'll, so I give you the, so I give you all the code. Or the slow fields, mm -hmm. right? And then you just have to, um, you're gonna be finding the, um, you know, given, you're gonna have to find, figure out or draw the equal, the um, uh, the phase diagram, and then use use octave to plot the slow fields. Okay. okay. The code will be provided. So I'll provide that in the assignment page, okay? All right. So I think what I'll do, uh, I'll go ahead and stop here. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll do a recording on Thursday. And then um, I'll send that out. Okay. So I think once we get into a rhythm here, I think it'll be better. Everybody can try to get everybody up to speed. Because so I know a lot of you like are kind of like at a different pace right now. So make sure that you do your exam corrections, all right? You can still submit them, all right? My screen. So, okay. So, so, all right. So, I'm going to stop here. Okay. Unless there's any other questions. All right. So, I will do. I will do this again on Thursday. If you're, you know, if you're welcome to join, right? Okay. All right. So, I'll stop here. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. And if you have any questions in the meantime, you can always send me an email. Right? Okay. Have a good night. Too. Thank you. Um, I think that was good. I think I, you know, I think everybody you get everybody up to speed. I know there's uh, there's like oh, there's four of you. Right. What was the average on the test? Uh, not too good. <laughs> You're like, you got the best score. Really? Yeah. 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 That's why I was encouraging them. I, you know, I was encouraging them to do their corrections. They didn't, they didn't submit yet. But it's, you know, they should um, just to, you know, not only boost up their score, but to uh, understand, understand the material. material. By the way, so you're working on, yeah, so for the Amatic. So I was thinking about that problem, actually. I was thinking about it. And then you have to start off, um, there, you need some kind of logistic model, right? Or not, well, you need some kind of, uh, so think of it, think of it in terms of a distribution system. We were thinking of doing, since it says uh, focus on K through 16 education, yeah. Yeah. there's uh, one thing that we were talking about is the federal free breakfast program. Mm -hmm. And then in order to work more locally, I suggest you we work with either FCPS or ACPS. Okay. Um, so Fairbanks County or Arlington, since okay. uh, Peter's from Arlington, I'm from Fairbanks County, we would have experience with like, the school system. Okay. And then we can do, uh, uh, we can do research on how like, 
the county governments handle uh, okay. educational right. food distribution. Right. So yeah. that's kind of like our thought right now. Okay, oh, that's good. See, we, yeah, because eventually you're gonna have to come up with a structure and then some uh, oh. some optimal, yeah, and then some optimal, some way and, to optimize it. Yeah, uh, Peter says he also has some uh, programming experience. So modeling with code would also be a very good idea. And oh yeah, for sure, yeah. We're trying to we're trying to uh, use Python for that. Okay, that would be great. Okay. And let just like try to check in. Send me you know send me what you have so I can so that way don't send it to me like on the very last you know like second to last day it's due. You gotta make sure you know like you're on track. Uh, I think yeah. we're gonna okay. meet next Tuesday at Alexandria. Okay. So that's like okay. kind of halfway. Okay. And then we'll send another check. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Sure. Sure. I'm, I'm, I think it's. I think. I mean, I can read the textbook all I want, but I never really like the type of understanding when I say, "Oh, uh -huh. the general set of solutions yeah. for an n order uh, differential equation depends on an n element basis yeah. that spans the space of the general solutions." Like that would not. I would not have read that. Well, and that's something that I really appreciate having a lecture for, so I can see it written out and then go like, "Oh, right, that's cool." Yeah, I wish I would have done this earlier. Sorry, I didn't. Like, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, I still. I mean, but at least it's the, intro, the first yeah. order is like pretty. Easy first order is not too bad for anyone yeah. who's like yeah. finished the calculus yeah. series. So, yeah. All right. And I'm glad Very that good. I like have a lot of it is because I took a lot of math in high school. Yeah. So I can think about like especially differential equations, like you know how to do normal equations, you just differentiate them yeah. and go back. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Have a good evening. You too, thank you. Yeah.